Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our weekly webinar with the FRCS Mentor Group. Um, we are privileged today to have uh, Mr. Campana delivering a very important topic in the exam. This is pelvic fracture. It comes in many forms and shapes, and many questions are asked around it. Um, so Mr. Campana is well equipped to talk about this, and I will be uh, introducing him in more details in a bit. Before that, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, courses we deliver uh, for the Viva courses for the FRCS. If you are interested in that, please go to our website and you can regi register for the upcoming course. These are held frequently and manned by uh, experienced staff. In addition, uh, you can register on our Telegram group where there will be a lot of discussions about this talk or other talks that we've had in the past, in addition to plenty of resources handling all aspects of the FRCS exam. Um, in addition, we've got a book, which you can see the picture behind me about it. This is a summary of the whole exam. Uh, please, you can get that book from all um, uh, reputable bookstores, including a PDF version and, sorry, online versions. Now, the talk itself is interactive and at the minute, at, in the middle, uh, there will be a chance for you to participate in teaching cases, which uh, Mr. Campana has prepared. Uh, so people who are interested in that, please let Mr. Hanari, Shuan Hanari know that you want, and he will uh, keep your name for the interactive part. In addition, today we will be doing a Viva, and if you want to be uh, considered for the Viva session, please let Mr. Maimoun know. In both cases, you can please use the chat function to talk to them directly rather than raise hand because raise hand can mean many things for, you know, we don't know whether you wanted the interactive part or the Viva part or what. Lastly, uh, but not leastly, if you have questions about this talk, put them on the side and we have uh, two mentors who will be looking after these and delivering them to Mr. Campana at the end of the first part of the talk. Now that admin bit is over, uh, may I introduce Mr. Campana, who is our consultant in Salford Hospital deliver, uh, dealing with uh, pelvic injuries. He had his MS in India and then completed his orthopedic training in the UK. He had two fellowships in uh, Southampton dealing with uh, hip uh, and pelvic surgery for 18 months. Then he was a locum consultant in the MTC in Southampton, then at 18 months at a consultant in MTC, which is Salford. So he has seen all sorts of trauma and he deals with trauma to the pelvic in all its forms, including femoral head fracture. Uh, he is currently an undergraduate examiner and soon, hopefully, we will, he will be an examiner for the FRCS. So who better to talk about this from the FRCS part, apart from him? Without further ado, I give the mic to Mr. Campana and the... Hello, can you hear me, all of you? Yeah, thank you, uh, Abdullah. Thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, my name is, uh, you know, Mr. Kempana, Vijay Kempana, as uh, Abdullah said. I work here in Salford and I worked before in uh, Southampton as a consultant. So I'm just consultant around the fourth year of, as a consultant. Um, so basically, I was being told that the, you're all uh, you know, exam going here. So don't think that I am a, a lecturer here and you are students there. So this is pretty much an interactive, uh, whatever the, you know questions you have, I'm more than happy to answer to my ability. Uh, you can interrupt me anytime uh, when we are going. So uh, the pelvic fracture itself is a very, very big topic. It takes good, uh, you know, at least three, four hours if I just have to go through uh, everything in detail. But I have just concise a few things which are very likely to be asked in exam. So we'll just try and concentrate uh, more on that uh, sort of thing, the examination side, rather than uh, going into a full uh, theoretical, uh, which is there in all the books. Anybody can uh, read at any time. So that is... Uh, 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 how do, yeah, okay, so 
this is uh, my little introduction thanks to abdullah so which he has uh, given already so there are a few facts you need to be aware of this uh, pelvic fracture so there are so many things which is written in the book but what is been to be expected in the exam or what you need to be a very concise uh, you know few things which you need to be aware so it's a high energy injury in most of the young people or it's a the fragility fractures in the elderly patients so then you need to be just aware there is a 15% risk of mortality with the closed pelvic fractures and it is a 50% in open pelvic fractures so these are the figures which you just have to be aware of so there are other injuries which comes later but uh, the examination wise one would like to know there is a 50% mortality for a open pelvic fracture that means you every second patient can die of so you just have to be very well aware of this and how to manage these ones which will come to that bit later so so the, the other group which you have to be aware is the which group of pelvic fracture patients are or high risk for a high mortality so you just have to be aware the elderly patients more than 60 years with a pelvic fracture and the systolic blood pressure 90 and below on presentation or uh, people with the increased uh, injury severity score so the injury severity score if they really go on to ask exactly you need to be aware what is injury severity score how do we measure this is uh, one of the Uh, trauma scores which uh, all of you should be aware of it's there in most of the textbooks for this particular uh, pelvic fracture injury severity score of more than 17 is a uh, high risk of mortality you just have to be aware of that figure but the uh, general figure is around 15 but if they go for specifics say that it is a 17 but uh, please do read what this injury severity score and there is something called a modified injury severity score now so there is a difference between these two uh, there were some flaws in the original injury severity score that has been rectified in the modified uh, uh, score please do uh, read about this the other category of patients who are high mortality is people who are needing a very high transfusion especially more than 4 units on admission they are the high risk of mortality and the other category is a uh, apc B, which is an anterior posterior compression injury of the pelvis, type three, and a vertical shear injury. I'll come to that a bit, little bit later. What is this APC three? What is this vertical shear injury? So the other ones uh, you need to be just uh, gently aware uh, is that associated injuries. So these ones are there in every book. So any polytrauma patient will have a chest injury, long bone fractures, spine fracture. and the one more specifically we have to mention with the pelvic ring fractures is a sexual dysfunction is up to 50% in the uh, pelvic ring fractures especially anterior ring fractures uh, so that means that one needs to be aware of this uh, complication when we are dealing with the pelvic fractures so the other important thing is that head and abdominal injury which uh, you know will come to that later and the urological injury which is around up to 30% so there are certain guidelines which i'll tell you a bit later and there is these ones all there on the website uh, how do we go about managing this uh, so next come to mechanism of injury which you all of you know which i don't i just thought that i should just uh, present these ones they are all in the book don't need to go much details but i'll just briefly go so the first one is the apc anterior posterior compression which is that means you are being hit on the front of your pelvis the lateral compression which you are being hit on the lateral side of the pelvis the vertical shear which is a hemi pelvis migrates proximally and the combined combined ap and lateral compression so that can be any form so this is the classification uh, which some of the old uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons are still using this so tile and panel classification this is basically based on the stability of the pelvis 
So these ones are being very straightforward. So you can only say that uh, the, which are the fractures which are stable, which are the fractures which are rotationally unstable, and which are the fractures which are rotationally and vertically unstable. So these are three categories, type A, type B, type C. So type A is the stable ring fractures. Which are they? So these are the ones, these are the avulsion factors. Avulsion of the scale tuberosity, which is one of the common things which can happen in high impact athletes. Avulsion of the anterior inferior iliac spine, which you see sometimes in an adolescence when there is a secondary ossification center fuses. There's a you know, pull off of the uh, rectus of the anterior inferior iliac spine, that is the second common. Then the you know the anterior superior iliac spine sometimes rarely. So these are the sort of avulsion factors. But if you take a overall ring, the ring is made up of two iliac bones and the sacrum in the backside in the middle, and you've got two sacroiliac joints, and then the front is being connected by the pubic symphysis. So the overall ring itself is intact in this uh, uh, type A category. So that's why they are stable. And these are the stable injuries. Majority of the times, they don't need surgical intervention. But however, if they go for a details and a highly displaced, which is a massively displaced anterior inferior iliac spine or a ischial tuberosity, we do fix them. We do fix them in a high performing athletes or high performing individuals. So we don't go and fix these the avulsion fractures normally, very unlikely, not in, definitely not in a sedentary patients. So pain relief, and they can carry on with the mobilization. So the next category is pelvic rings, which are rotationally unstable, vertically stable. So these are the ones which are opens in the front, which is an open book type of pelvic fracture, where the pelvis on both iliac crests open up with the pubic symphysis. So they are rotationally unstable, whereas vertically they are stable. You can see that both the uh, SI joints are still intact. The posterior uh, SI joint ligaments are intact. That's why the hemipelvis will not shift uh, upwards or downwards. So those are the you know, category of patients. You can see that the lateral compression, uh, ipsilateral type, that is one of the another example. So next comes to type C. Type C is the one where you got a vertically unstable and which are also rotationally unstable. So these are the ones where you see that uh, you know, APC3, you know, anterior posterior compression type of injuries, which I'll show you in a second. What are these? Uh, and also these are the ones, the vertically unstable is a vertical shear injury, APC3 or, you know, LC3. So let us take some pictures of these uh, just so that you can understand better. So this is a uh, classification. You can see that uh, clearly tile A, tile B, tile C. So in the first one, sorry. So you see that uh, in the okay. just um, so you can see that uh, type A, the, so there is an avulsion fracture there, that is the iliac uh, wing fracture. And um, so in type B, which is a rotationally unstable, so you can see that the you know, open book fractures are type B. Uh, whereas uh, even the lateral compression, one of these types, which is also a rotationally unstable, but uh, these ones have got a intact posterior SI ligaments, they are vertically stable. So type three is the one you can see that. So they are unstable on the posterior ring as well as anterior ring where the hemi pelvis can be shifted upwards or downwards. So those are the ones which are type C. So that is the one which used to be the case where the you know, old type of uh, pelvic surgeons use this used to be uh, much more commonly before, but now most commonly the practicing pelvic surgeons across the country, we use this one. It is the Eng and Burgess, very concise. It will even by, you know, if you tell me that it is a APC one, I can imagine in my brain 
how the APC one, what will be this factor. So that will tell the direction of the force, and the type of factor. You can see that. Um, so the you can see that in the you can see that in the first line you got a lateral compression types. In the second line you can see APC. You can third one is a vertical shear. This is the classification of Engenberg's, which is commonly used by a practicing surgeons. There is a one more classification called AO or a OTA. AO classification is not for a people who are practicing. It is more of a research purposes. But uh, this is the one one should be aware of. So if you look at the, the first line, lateral compression injuries. So, <coughs> so how to remember this? How to remember type 1, type 2, type 3? So just for a, just for your knowledge, just for majority of the times, this the 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 exam they will not ask you. You know they are not very particular about the the type of uh, or a classification. But if you can show that you know, that will make them much more clear. So you've got the three types of lateral compression you can see. So type one is the one where you see the only one side of the pubic ramus is fractured. So this is a very common thing in, in practice. Whenever we see, you see that you get a lot of referrals from a medical side. So they say that, oh, you've got this 85 year old patient with a pubic ramus fracture, what should we do? So if you look at this uh, pelvic ring, pelvic ring is like a polo mint. It will never break in one place. When you see a one break, it will be invariably there will be a break elsewhere. So in the LC1 or a lateral type compression, lateral compression type one, you can see that uh, the you can see that the the unilateral one side of the pubic ramus is fractured. When you go and uh, see them in the X-ray, you can't see much in the sacrum because of the complex anatomy. But however, if you do a CT scan you are very likely 95% and above chance that you will find a fracture on the sacrum on the backside or at the SI joint. So it all depends on the patient, whether uh, you know whether you want to do a CT scan or whether you can say you don't need any, any scan. So I'm happy with this. This is a lateral compression type one injury. So the reason why I say is that the most of the in the textbook says lateral type one compression injuries are managed conservatively, but the things are changing gradually. Where there are certain category of lateral compression injuries are unstable, where we fix them. But uh, in the examination, just to go through to you know get through the pass for all uh, theoretical purpose, if you say lateral type one injury is managed conservatively. So that means that you've got a unilateral fracture, but the posterior fracture will be in the sacrum. So that is a type one. Whereas in type two, in the anteriorly, you can see that same unilateral pubic rami fracture, but you can see a big fracture over the iliac crest. And that means it is a segmental fracture of the ileum. So anteriorly at the pubic rami, and the posteriorly just around the SI joint. So you can see that picture. So that I will show you some x-rays a bit later. You can see what is that type two. So this is called a crescent. So this is a, a crescent fracture. So it's a very typical of, uh, uh, yeah, so you can see that that's very clearly. So this is a very typical of uh, type two APC anterior posterior compression injury, or sorry, lateral compression injury. So then comes the type three. So what is the difference between type three and uh, type two? So type three, you will have a bilateral pubic rami. So when you see a bilateral pubic rami, you can pretty much imagine it is a type three. And invariably, when you do a CT scan, you can see there will be either fracture in the ileum or fracture in the sacrum uh, on the posterior. So these are the type of uh, uh, lateral compression type. So type one is managed conservatively. You can let them wait where majority or as I said, it's a fragility type of fractures. 
whereas type 2 and type 3 they are unstable type of fractures they are unstable radiologically and the type 3 lateral compression injury can bleed up to 2 to 2 and a half liters so that is one of the high risk bleeding fractures so that is about the lateral compression so ne next comes the apc which is a very common and uh, so this is in other words it's called a open book uh, pelvis when you see open book pelvis when you hear that word that's that indicates it is a apc anteroposterior compression so type 1 you can see again a small gap at the at the pubic symphysis so the disruption of the pubic symphysis ligaments here so usually it says the the literature says it is around 2.5 cm or less why 2.5 cm what does it indicate why not 3 cm so the 2.5 cm of opening at the pubic symphysis here that indicates the disruption is only at the pubic symphysis ligaments whereas disruption on the back side at the si joint and the uh, sacro tuberous and the sacrospinous ligaments are intact so that means that only one set of ligaments which are in the front which are damaged whereas the most important ligaments in this pelvic stability is from the ligaments around the si joint posterior si joint ligaments are very crucial for the stability of the pelvis so that is the type one type one means less than 2.5 cm opening whereas type 2 is more than 2.5 cm opening at the pubic symphysis so what is this 2.5 cm as i said you can see that in the picture where is this yeah so you can see that in the picture so sacro tuberous and the sacro spinous ligaments are ruptured here so what does that do as soon as that ruptures you can see on the back side you got si joints si joints are just like an inch so you got a one inch front two inches on the back so if you open the front hinge the back hinges open so you see that the left si joint is opened up there so that is the type 2 type 2 means the anterior si joint ligaments are ruptured but the posterior si joint ligaments are intact that's why this hinge opens but it is not completely unstable because the posterior side ligaments are still intact. So that is type 2 APC. Whereas type 3, again, the you know, complete rupture of the pubic symphysis here in the front and the back, both anterior as well as posterior SI joint ligaments are completely ruptured. This entire ileum is literally about to float, but it is still there in place. But if it uh, you know, moves up or down, then it is called a vertical shear. Vertical shear. So, only difference between the vertical shear and the APC3 is that the APC3, it can become a vertical shear. But in APC3, it is the main ligamentous injury where you involve the SI joint ligaments which are destroyed, whereas the anterior pubic ramus uh, symphysis which are being disrupted. So the entire ileum on the one side, either left or right, or left or right is completely unstable. This is one of those rotationally and vertically unstable. Whereas if you look at this type B or type 2 APC, that is rotationally unstable, but vertically stable. So next comes is the vertical shear injury. Vertical shear injury, you can see that half of the pelvis can be shifted up. So this is the one of the most dangerous type of pelvic fractures which we come across. The mortality rate is more than 30 to 40 percent in these uh, vertical shear injuries. And these are the ones very high risk for a bleeding. So the risk of bleeding is very high in these because they can tear apart the, the important vessels which are just uh, present in front of the SI joint in front of this pubic rami, important vessels in front of the pubic rami or our external iliac vessels, one on the in front of the SI joint is the internal iliac vessels. So they can bleed like a tap. So any questions about this, uh, this classification? Anybody wants to ask any particular 
if you if you got any any doubts or anything or any easy way to remember uh, so this is what so for the lateral compression if you see only one side uh, one side of the pubic rema is fractured usually it is lc1 but an associated uh, iliac crest fracture is lc2 whereas bilateral pubic rema is lc3 but again ap compression it's just a you know the 2.5 cm or more than that it's opening in the front so all all the apc are open book just a severity so just to be aware that uh, sacral fractures are very common uh, which uh, many of you probably will not come across if you start uh, doing a ct scan for most of our uh, elderly pubic rema fractures you see this so majority will have an associated sacral fracture they are all a fragility type of fractures in them but in the young people it is the high energy injuries so you just have to be aware of this normally they won't ask you but i think you just have to be aware so there are three types as per the dennis classification so why it is the significance of this classification why why you need to know so when whenever they say whenever my registrar calls me and say this is a zone 1 uh, injury then i know that this is a very less risk of bleeding less risk of nerve injury whereas if they say type 2 or zone 2 then i know that the risk of nerve injury is quite high because it involves the sacral foramen when the nerve roots exit so these are the and the zone 3 is in the middle of the in the sacrum where the spinal canal and uh, you know cord equina is involved so if you look at the zone 1 that is this the lateral sacral layla it's called so this is the area of the sacral layla the risk of nerve injury with these fractures in this zone is less than 6% whereas in zone 2 it is around 25 to 28% in zone 3 it is 55 to 57% so just have to be aware i'm sure they are not going to ask but you just have to be aware you know if you are an frcs uh, exam taking handed they just expect you to know uh, as a, at least for a theory it may not be in practical but theory they may ask these things so in zone 3 uh, injuries where there is a high risk of uh, nerve injury they have been further classified by guy called rai camille you just uh, need to know but i am sure this is not going to be asked this is only a people who you know be aware of this pelvic surgery who are doing some fellowships they will know or some of them even doesn't know so the type 3 of dennis classification is further classified by rai camille uh, so just say that it is a flexion and extension type i wouldn't go bit more than that so you see that uh, flexion type and which is the distal fragment flexes forwards uh whereas the extension type the distal fragment you know displaces distally but uh, uh, in the exam they certainly they won't ask just to be aware the name rai camille classification uh but this is a very highly specialized for pelvic surgeons to deal with so the other thing which you need to be aware is this one so this is a dangerous variety of uh, uh, fracture this is not been described in your dennis classification so this is called spinal pelvic dissociation so whenever you see a bilateral uh, sacral fracture so that is a sort of uh, in being classified under this spinal pelvic dissociation so if you look at this uh, type 1 where you got a u type so if you see that this is a s1 body the sacral you know first the sacral body and if you see that the fracture on both sides and there is a transverse fracture here so this uh, s1 is with the rest of the uh, lumbar spine so the rest of the pelvis from s1 on either side and below is completely cut off from the rest of the spine so that is the reason why these these injuries are called you know spino pelvic dissociation that means the pelvis is dissociated from the spine they are a very serious injury very easy to miss and uh, one should be very well aware of this so these are further classified into uh, you know h type where the fractures goes all along on either side 
and you get an associated transverse fracture. And you can see that it's a lambda type. Then it can be a T type. So what is this uh, significance? The significance is that the spinopelvic dissociation that, that indicates that it's a very high energy injury, number one. Number two is that high risk of nerve injury with this. Number three is that this needs to be sort of managed specifically by a, in a specialist, in a specialist center. So that's what you need to be just aware of. And this, the management involves, unless patient is medically unwell, is uh, involving the lumbar fixation and connecting that lumbar fixation to the pelvis. So just I'm giving a brief idea. I don't think they will ask uh, these things in detail, but just have to be aware. The spinal pelvic dissociation, the management normally involves. So lumbar pelvic fixation, I'll show you some picture a bit later as we go along. So the another thing uh, for the FRCS exam, what the examiner expects you to know that there is a risk of 15 to 30% risk that the urological injury. This is, is one of the important things you really have to be aware in a complex pelvic injuries, especially a type three a lateral compression type and a APC, open book injuries, the risk of bladder. The bladder is just sitting behind the pubic symphysis. So bladder is just behind the pubic symphysis. When you sustain an APC, anteroposterior compression injury, the bladder is directly in front of you. So the risk of rupturing a bladder or risk of you know rupturing the urethra is quite high, it's around 30%. So there are certain signs which you need to be aware. So these are the signs. One is that blood in the meatus, bruising around the groin, bruising around the scrotum, and unable to pass the urine, and even unable for you to pass the catheter. Uh, with the PR, you can see that high riding prostate. These are all there in the textbook, you don't need to. So I'm only just uh, trying to sort of, you know, reinforce your, your uh, this thing. How do we diagnose them? So any patient who can't pass the urine or any pelvic fracture patients, so, or when there is a blood in the, in the urine, you got to have a high suspicion that this patient is likely to have a, uh, one of these, either a bladder or a urethral rupture, in that case. So as an FRCS candidate, you should know that we should try attempting to pass the catheter gently, only one attempt. If it doesn't go, stop there. Don't try to damage further. You have to involve the urologist at that time. So that is the baseline. So don't try to attempt more than only one gentle attempt, passing a catheter. So as a pelvic uh, fellow or one of the pelvic guys, what we do, we do do this uh, cystogram, we put the dye directly into the, into the bladder, or we do retrograde urethrogram. That will tell us where this rupture is. So there are guidelines for this. The guidelines is called BAUS, BAUS guidelines. It is there. There are around 20 points in that BAUS guidelines. You don't need to know all the 20 points, but there are salient features. So just uh, salient features, what we practice normally in normal practice, if it is a extra peritoneal blood rupture, the urologist, they don't repair them. What they do, they do manage conservatively. They do either go for a supra pubic catheter or they can manage to pass a catheter uh, by using some sort of methods and they will leave it to heal up. If it is an intraperitoneal rupture, they do repair. So this is just a general guideline, but there are very specific uh, guidelines there if you go to BAUS guidelines. There are some guidelines, uh, there are some points in the BOST guideline as well. So please go through BOST guidelines, which is very important. You have to mention this in the exam when you're answering urological injury associated with pelvic fracture. They're all very clear. So I don't want to go there because it will take a time. So other thing which you need to be aware uh, is the source of pelvic hemorrhage. So what is, you know, everybody speaks about pelvic fracture means bleed to death. That's what the, the imagination impression. What bleeds really? So 80% of our pelvic fracture bleeding comes from the venous. And part of it at uh, 80 to 90 percent is from the bleeding bone surface, especially if you've got an iliac uh, bone fracture, they bleed like a, 
a small artery in fact so and the venous the, there is extensive venous uh, plexus which are just in front of the sacral sacrum and the si joint so that's why the posterior injuries especially bilateral sacral fractures or si joint disruption so you can see that uh, there is a significant uh, venous bleeding uh, and so only 10% you know with the literature and with our experience we know that the risk of arterial bleed is around 10%. So you don't need to be too worried that the pelvis always bleeds with the artery. Artery bleeding is only 10%. This, this figures you need to be aware. The reason is that this comes with the management. So 80% of 80 to 90% comes from the venous, uh, venous uh, system and the bleeding bone surface. That means we do restore this anatomy and uh, make it a closed space pelvis when it opens up, these venous plexus bleeds. So just contain that pelvis back, either with the binder or some form of uh, closure of the pelvis, so that a tamponade, once it bleeds to certain level, maybe up to two liters, then it acts as a tamponade. So if it is a venous and the bone surfaces, they will stop. But if it is arterial, they continue to bleed, that is only 10% among these pelvic factors. So the common, uh, the art arteries which uh, likely to bleed is a superior gluteal artery, uh, external iliac, internal iliac, obturator, coronal arteries, and the pudendal arteries. So there are nine branches of the internal iliac artery if you want to be very specific. So I'm not sure you know anybody would ask all the nine of you. So just have to be aware at least the superior gluteal artery and the coronal arteries. Whenever you see a pubic remi fracture, Coronomartis, which is very, very close by, that is a risk that can bleed. Whenever you see a fracture around the greater sciatic notch, that's where the superior gluteal artery bleeds. Whenever you see a disruption of the posterior ring, especially around the SI joint, especially the fractures of the, the sacrum, they, they are the ones which can cause the bleeding from the internal iliac artery, which is just in front of them. So I can tell what do we do in, in these cases? And there is an algorithm. How do we manage these, uh, these uh, unstable? That we will tell at the end, or I can pass it on. This is a, the algorithm regarding a managing a, a bleeding pelvis um, or a you know, unstable, hemodynamically unstable patient is uh, based on each individual MTC snow. Everybody has got a different uh, protocol. But I can pass it on to one what we have in Salford uh, to Abdullah a bit later. So this is a, just a picture to show how big the vessels are. So extensively vascular, so they can bleed like anything. So just have to be aware. So you can see that uh, in a common iliac artery dividing into external and internal uh, and further into the femoral artery and so on. So whenever we see a pelvic fracture, this is one of the exam. Examiner, they will just put up that X-rays. Uh, they will show some sort of uh, LC1 or LC2 type of fractures. And they will give a scenario, unstable, uh, hemodynamically unstable patient uh, scenario. So you have to be aware, pelvis is one source, but there are other source which you have to have a high suspicion. So one of them, you can see that if there is a obvious open wounds, you can you know what is bleeding. But the chest, so it is uh, very, very, you know, uh, you know, easy to miss these closed spaces, especially thorax can accommodate up to 1.5 to 2 liters of blood. So one has to be very aware that, uh, uh, you know, chest is a source, it can bleed. Then the abdomen, retroperitoneal space, up to 3 to 4 liters. Then the long bone fractures, which you all know, all the femoral fractures, how they can bleed. So what category of pelvic fractures are high risk for hemorrhage? These are the ones. So vertical shear is highest. The next comes APC3. The next comes is LC3. So these are the ones which are very high risk for bleeding in the pelvic fractures. The, the other ones also bleed but they are non, not known to cause a mortality, they bleed to death. So 
they all have some bleeding. Whenever you see a valve fracture, either type one, type two, if you see a CT report, there will be some bleed. So, but they all, as I said, venous bleed, majority stops. But these are the ones can be associated with arterial bleed, and uh, they can tear apart a big vessel, not a small vessel, big vessel like internal iliac artery or external iliac artery. They all bleed to that. So it just have to be examination theory part. So people do have to be aware. These are the high category, high risk category for hemorrhage. So whenever they ask in examination, pelvic st uh, the stability uh, when they are putting these X-rays up to the pelvis, you have to be very clear whether it is a radiological instability or it is a uh, patient unstable, which is a hemodynamic instability. You have to make sure which which instability they are speaking about, and you have to be very clear about it. So, as I said earlier in the classification, the type you know type two type 3 lateral compression, type 2, type 3 APC, and vertical shear, they're all unstable, radiologically unstable pelvic fractures. You've got to be aware. Except type 1. Type 1 lateral compression, type 1 APC uh, are considered as stable. But the rest all, radiologically unstable. But the hemodynamic unstability, which I'm sure you, you, you all know, systemic blood pressure, pulse, and the other, other factors. So what defines the, the shock? So hypotensive shock, they're all part of this hemodynamic instability. So next, I just wanted to put this picture. The reason why I put this is, so everybody has to be aware of this. So sometimes they do keep this in the examination. So this is a pelvic binder. Uh, this is the, we start with the management part here. So management wise, uh, we'll start with this pelvic binder. So the first and foremost, whenever you know, any polytrauma patient on site seen by an ambulance uh, to the first they do is that they will check the blood pressure, check the, the pulse. If they see that there are any signs of bleeding anywhere, they will, they will go, unless it is a long bone, open bleeding bones, so or open wounds, they always go and put this binder on. Why I'm showing this picture it's not that you don't know. You all know that this is a pelvic binder, but one should be knowing clearly where to apply this correctly. So the pelvic binder is meant to apply at where you can close the pelvis. So that one, not at the iliac crest level. Majority when we see in practice, we get a lot of these referrals from the, from the peripheral district general hospitals. I think this uh, binder, Around the iliac crest, where you feel the, where the, you feel the both iliac crest for stability. It's not. <laughs> this should be centered over the bread trochanter. So the pelvic binder should be centered, and both the legs should be internally rotated. Put these two toes, you know, two big toes together, and that itself will help. And put this binder and close the binder and tighten this uh, uh, binder. So that is the one which closes the pelvis. So one could think, boy, well, this is quite good for a APC injury. Open book pelvis, yes, you need to close the pelvis. Book is open, you close the book. But there is no contraindication to apply this any pelvic fracture. Doesn't matter. It's a lateral compression. Doesn't matter. It's a vertical shape. But still, you can go and apply in a bleeding fashion. There is no contraindication for that. And that is the correct site to be applied. One more thing to be aware, and uh, you know, in examination, if they ask, so ideally, both guidelines also says clearly, this pelvic binder is temporary. We should not try and leave it more than 24 hours. If you leave it more than 24 hours, there is a risk of pressure source, risk of skin at risk. So you have to have an alternative after 24 hours, either looking to put an external fixator or looking to do definitive fixation or you can try releasing this binder after a certain four to six hours. You see sometimes blood clots inside the pelvis and it is very unlikely to sort of uh, you know, dislodge unless you keep moving the patient. So you just have to be aware. So this is a C clamp they used to use previously, but not commonly used nowadays. So C clamps are quite good. If you see here, 
it has got a it has got it you know two sharp rods so these goes over the posterior si joint area the one downside about this c clamp is that it closes the posterior ring it doesn't close the anterior ring so they used to use this but nowadays very very rare it's only taught in some courses uh, just for you know theory sake practically we don't use this one just to be aware pelvic binder is used everywhere you know it's available in most of the dghs most of the hospitals across the uk so just have to be aware that is one of the things which the examiner expects you to this is another one so this is just like a tourniquet pneumatic anti shock garment but this is certainly not not in the civilian practice this is all used in in the military practice but i don't think you need to be aware of that there are risks comes with that and there's got a very specific time you need to apply so i wouldn't be sort of going too much into that just a theory said you need to be aware anti shock garments were used at one point they are like a tourniquet so this is the one you need to be aware this is the one you need to be aware even in a dgh so if you imagine you are a consultant tomorrow so what the examiner wants you know know from you you are a safe safe consultant so there are uh, you know not you don't need to be a pelvic surgeon to do this so everybody every orthopedic surgeon should have a general skill of putting a, an x fix for this pelvis so this is a temporary sometimes that can be a permanent as well so just have to be aware there are two types of external fixator so one is this is called an anterior external fixator where you put the pins in the iliac crest so the next one is the suprastabular external fixator so many times this is much more effective and efficient in closing the anterior ring but as a general orthopedic surgeon one should be well aware of this one so and you should be able to do this in a general setup and the examiner expect you to know this at least as a temporary measure in a dgh and until it's the patient is been transferred safely into the mtc or in a pelvic unit wherever so so this is uh, you can uh, you know do very easily they used to do at one time in accident emergency department but now the recommendation is straight away should be ideally done in theaters so it does involve using your normal external fixator pins so two pins usually 5 mm pins for a thin patient thin lady or 6 mm sange pins we call it as so for the males so just 2 cm behind from the anterior superior iliac spine the reason for a anterior superior iliac spine 2 cm behind is that one you have a lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh which is very close to the the inguinal ligament at the site of attachment number 2 is that your best bone and a thick bone is 2 cm behind the the anterior superior iliac spine so that is called gluteal pillar so that has got a thick a decent bone quality that's where you can introduce two things so you have to be aware so don't try to you know don't need to be very very small incisions in here to inch uh, incision feel the iliac crest just like you take a bone graft open it properly 2 inches feel the iliac crest just uh, fire two of these uh, uh, sange pins either using a drill or with the t handle so just connect the connect the so that is the one you know thing you just have to be aware and you should be able to do that so that is the supra stabular x fix very efficient but again you know this is very sort of it needs a quite a bit of training to do this and uh, it is not easy uh, unless you do this regularly but just have to be aware i'm not aware of this i am aware of this but i am not well versed to do this but i am quite happy to do the anterior uh, x fix so i mean then now these are some of this uh, you know open method of fixation which i will show you some pictures just for just for a theory uh, let us just go further i'll show you these pictures bit later so you can see there this is a, again you know very easy to classify 
So if somebody wants to see that there is a bilateral ubiquitin factor here, so very you know, easy to tell this is a LC3, LC3 factor. So usually stabilized on the backside by percutaneous uh, uh, sacroiliac screws. And in the front, we do what is called an infix, which is an essential an external fixator, which everything is under the skin. So I'll just uh, go a bit more further than we will we'll come to that. This is another method of fixation of the sacro fractures. It's called posterior transsacral iliac plating. And uh, you can see that there is a screw as well that is the ilio sacral screw on the top. So this is another picture just to show that uh, open reduction of the both uh, uh, both uh, you know pubic rami fractures on both sides. You can see that the long plate going. So, yeah, so you can see that the plate goes along the anterior column, all along here, in the anterior column. So on the back side you got the transsacral screw. So this is another method, open method of fixing the the anterior SI joint. So this is what is called lumbopelvic fixation, which I was speaking earlier. Whenever there is a spinal pelvic dissociation, one should be aware that uh, we will do this lumbopelvic fixation. So what the examiner wants from you? Uh, what exactly examiner wants you? So all this, uh, what I was telling you is uh, purely, it's, uh, you know, only about this uh, management of uh, uh, acute pelvic fractures. But when the exam, the very unlikely they will just put only pelvis saying that this is a pelvic fracture how do you manage no they always majority 90 percent of times you get this as a part of uh, a scenario they give you a polytrauma patient the bilateral femoral fracture is that one of those pelvic fractures so they just come to that pelvis at the end but before that you need to have a broader knowledge of managing this uh, a polytrauma so they look at you, the examiner always look at you as a day one, a safe consultant in any case. So they, you know, they are always expect you to be there. Okay, you are in a DGH. How do you manage this scenario? That's what and they want to see you, how cleverly you use your brain or your knowledge to just get out of that situation. So they're just testing you as a day one safe consultant in NHS. That's what you need to be, keep it in mind. So what they see here, so they see a few things. One is that when they give you a scenario like a polytrauma, so they want to see whether you are able to decision make, your decision making, your urgent planning in the very you know, urgent scenarios and how you prioritize. So basically you have to be aware of the principles of damage control orthopedics. What is first, if you've got a scenario where you've got a pelvic fracture, a open book pelvic fracture, you got a bilateral femoral fracture, then you need to know what is important, what you are going to do immediately, what you got, what resources you got in your DGH. So you say a patient comes and they always give a scenario saying that, okay, patient comes at the Friday night at 11 o'clock. So who will be there at five or Friday night at 11 o'clock? Do you expect uh, every major trauma center consultant sitting there? No. So you are in DGH. Patient is being brought into the in one of these DGH for a immediate stabilization. Although the definite stabilization takes place elsewhere, a bit later, but you should be able to, in a situation where you should be able to manage this, to stabilize initially, at least temporarily, until you get this patient transferred safely into the major trauma centers. So that is that is a critical thinking. That is the one they look at. So you need to be aware. So next, uh, now after that, we need to be aware of ATLS, which I'm sure you all of you know uh, the principles and you know, how to approach a, approach a patient. So the, 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 the temporary stabilization of these pelvic fractures, which I said, pelvic binder, x fix These are the two things which you need to be aware of. You need to be able to do correct application of uh, pelvic binder. So you also should be aware in a, in a DGH, the resources are limited. Your expertise will be limited. So you need to know your limits. So that is the another thing which the, the examiner expects. You can't go and say that I will go and do this, this, this for this pelvis. Agree, you got a, a good knowledge. So you just have to answer in such a way that I am aware of all the principles 
but this needs to be done by somebody who does this regularly not just that you need to have resources to do that and not just uh, doing that in case if something goes wrong you should have a backup to deal with that complication so this is what you need to be aware of so that means that so they will look at your you know limit self limits what uh, what uh, you know up to what limit they will give a scenario if they say okay you are in a major trauma center what would you do then the next question comes how you definitely going to plan to manage these cases but until then <coughs> so at least the front first bit the temporary stabilization resuscitation and what is massive transfusion protocol how do you sort of resuscitate any trauma patient these are all basics one should be very well aware of. so <coughs> next one one you need to be aware in exam which is been asked is a massive transfusion protocol so you really need to be aware of this so there is a protocol in each and every trust but there is also a, a well known protocol so what is tranexamic acid within what limit what hours they should be given and how much blood transfusion in case if you have transfusing that is just a blood that is a ffp that is a platelet and in what ratio so that's all there in the book to read that is called massive transfusion protocol and this is the one in a unstable you know hemodynamically unstable patients doesn't need to be pelvic fracture any polytrauma patient you really need to be knowing this so this is a very key and this is been asked in a lot of examinations now so you need to be aware so the next one is when to transfer safely so that is called post guidelines you need to read post guidelines so sorry thank you so as i said post guidelines is very key everybody should be knowing this post guidelines there are 19 points in that so for the pelvic fracture there are post guidelines for everything open fractures and the you know all other lot of other injuries but the, for the pelvic fracture nowadays since the start of this uh, mtc is across the country so this is coming again and again in the exam so the bos guidelines you have to mention when you when you say bos guidelines about the pelvic fracture they knows that you have read and at least you know you score there you score some points there so but you really have to be aware so there is a real protocol so there is a protocol to say that uh, you know all these pelvic ring injuries are to be ideally stabilized within 72 hours that means even if the patient comes to dgh you should be safely transfer the patient after resuscitation or after binder after after external fixator to the trauma center nearest trauma center near to the pelvic unit sort of you know in 24 hours safely so that they can stabilize the pelvis within 72 hours to get a better outcomes so same thing with the acetabulum a stabular fractures so there is a post guidelines say that that has to be stabilized within 72 hours so there are you know again there are so many other you know things in that guidelines which you need to be aware the other thing we need to be aware is that so all these patients gets a ct scan and you know, when you get the ct scan in the binder you have to have an x ray out of out of binder there well please do read that one because if i go into there we will lose lot of time here so that's all there it's all in all the websites it's all in the book so read this bost guidelines for a pelvic fracture which is very clear and that is been expected in the exam so the you need to have a forward thinking so whenever these uh, cases has been put up in front of you saying that uh, you know polytrauma patient got this multiple bones broken so with the pelvic fracture you need to have a clear idea so first i will stabilize this then what i do stabilize the how do i stabilize this femurs and once i do stabilize this you know femur both femurs x fix binder to the pelvic uh, pelvis then uh, you know the state all the massive transfusion protocols all these the station measures once the patient is stable so you need to transfer to the uh, nearest trauma center but you need to have a an option there you need to think critically whether i can manage this patient here whether i can't manage here and the other thing to know whether this patients whether i should get an immediate advice or whether i can stabilize this temporarily 
then I can speak. These are the critical steps which you have to think. So if you don't have resources, you don't have any XVIX in your, in, your, in your place, when you don't have any blood banks open, when you don't have even X-ray after the hours, then you don't have much resources there. So you have to be aware, at least, you know, you need to have a ATLS protocol, initial recitation, the you know, transmission protocol, these sort of things which you need to go one by one. But you need to have to be keep thinking, what about this patient, whether I am going to keep uh, transferring. If I am transferring, is it this night or whether I am transferring tomorrow morning? So if you need a help, go for, you can always say, I, I need an advice, you can help. Examiner will, not, will never expect you to say, okay, no, 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 I will do this, I will do this, I will fix this now. So always say, I will take a, I will take an help, I will take an you know, advice. If they want me to do an, an external fixator, I'm quite happy to do. I know the methods, I will do it. But I will certainly take an advice from a, in a local MTC or local uh, you know, orthopedic uh, you know, pelvic consultant. So you just have to think about this. Then the last thing is that you need to know the clear algorithm. So whenever they put a you know, scenario in front of you, hemodynamically unstable patient that comes as a part of polytrauma, you need to be aware. Whenever they put this up, you need to be aware about the pelvis. How do you go about managing a pelvic, unstable pelvic fracture uh, who presents with the instability, hemodynamic uh, instability. That's what you need. So for that, I said now they every MTC, if you open the website of any MTC who deals with the pelvic factors, there is a protocol for them, majority at least. So you can read them and I can forward it to uh, Abdullah. Uh, you, can, you can go. So that is, there is a clear algorithm. So the, the way, uh, yeah, let me just see whether uh, I can just go through here. So the way we go normally is that whenever we see a patient uh, in our AE, so we assess whether he is stable hemodynamically or unstable. Then the question comes the, the radiologically afterwards. If the patient is stable, so you will get a normal recitation with the normal saline or finger lactate, whatever is being according to ATLS protocol. So then we decide the pelvic factor, whether it is a stable or unstable. So if it is a stable patient, then we decide when to deal with this uh, uh, pelvic factor, uh, depending on our availability of theaters and manpower skills, and so many other things. For unstable factors, you need to have a clear protocol. That is, every MTC has got that clear protocol. Please, you can look at any MTC, there will be a protocol for them in their a &E protocol. So. I can pass it on to uh, Abdullah if somebody is interested what we have at Sulphur, uh, you can take a look at it. So the other guidelines for the exam purpose, you really have to be aware, as I said, most pelvic fractures, BAUS, urological injury, and uh, this is a MTC and TORM. They will ask what is the MTC, what is TORM. So there are uh, 22 or 24 MTCs now across the country. Uh, so this is a very important, all the MTCs are being developed in the UK and uh, you know, across Europe, in Germany, UK, US. The reason is to get a better outcome with all these polytrauma patients where you can have every, everybody under the same roof. So yeah, just have to be aware. But there are some outcome scores which are very rarely been asked, not commonly. So they are called Majid score, Iowa score, Hanover score. Orlando score, they're all a pelvic related uh, you know, outcomes. I don't think they will expect you to know, but uh, in theory, if, by chance, if they ask, just, just, the, just for the theoretical purpose to know. So for the discussion wise, this is what uh, you need to be aware of. So most of the people will know, you know, the x fix which I already said types and how to do one. Then becomes the pelvic packing. This is a very hot topic nowadays. Pelvic, pelvic packing, angiogram and embolization. What is best in the what is best in the hemodynamically unstable patient? This is one of the very hot topics, which is the debate is going on everywhere. So the pelvic packing is the one 
where we pack the pelvis to stop the bleeding from the venous venous bleeding so after packing the pelvis i'll tell you where to pack after packing the pelvis you still have to put external fixator to close the pelvis so just by packing the pelvis it will not stop so after packing the pelvis you have to put the external fixator to close the ring so that acts as a tamponade the pelvic packing is packing the pelvis in a likely areas where they bleed so the likely areas where they bleed is on both sides of the pubic rami where a corona mortis is there so one should be aware of what is this corona mortis corona mortis is uh, an anastomosis uh, between the obturator vessels uh, and uh, the external iliac vessels so you need to be aware so they are just uh, sit in on top of the the pubic superior pubic rami then they rupture since they are very you know directly connected to the external iliac artery and vein they bleed like a tap so that's why you need to be aware that uh, you know that is one of the source so you need to pack there the pack just behind the superior pubic ramus on both sides then the other area where to pack pack the both si joint and on either side of the si joint bilaterally that's where the internal iliac artery and the vessels the the, the venous plexus the presacral venous plexus are there so these are the four areas which are been you know described to pack so packing these are the areas packing used to prevent the venous bleeding but very rarely they are been used for a arterial bleed arterial bleed you need angiogram but as i said earlier 80 90% chance your bleeding is likely from a venous only 10% is from the artery you pack the pelvis if it is still bleeding then you need to have an angiogram so identify the the bleed then ask the radiologist the interventional radiologist to embolize so what is the what is better the pelvic packing whether angiogram embolization so there are a lot of studies went across the country across the europe across the world so they looked at both whether the outcomes are better with the pelvic packing or outcomes are better with the angiogram and the embolization so certainly pelvic packing seems to be a better re, better option than angiogram the reason is that it is much quicker you don't need to wait for a specialist a radiologist to come and do that number 2 is that the pelvic packing can be done by either general surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon you know who works in the mtc so all the outcomes in the literature shows pelvic packing is better compared to angiogram because of these factors you can get the patient to theater well within you know within under 1 and 1/2 hours in the pelvic packing whereas angiogram they look that it takes between 2 to 3 hours so the that time is very crucial the outcomes are better with the pelvic packing so you can always say the literature you know there is a hot debate about which is better but the pelvic packing is better because of you know time constraints and better outcomes in the literature so then the other thing which you have to be aware and to read is the ribova ribova is i think i don't know how many of you are aware this is a last uh, way it's a last measure to prevent a uh, bleeding uh, which is in a non compressible area so say that uh, the pelvis is uh, you know uh, fractured the patient is bleeding and uh, the, the common iliac artery or internal iliac artery is bleeding like a tap it's quite a big vessel so these are the you know where you cannot access it is deep inside the pelvis so that's why rebova means it is the resuscitative you know endovascular balloon you know occlusion uh, you know angioplasty of the aorta so that means the you are you know inflating the balloon into the aorta so that there are three zones zone one in the thoracic uh, aorta which is uh in the thoracic aorta high up zone 2 in the uh, just above the you know suprarenal arteries just above the 
uh, below the mesenteric uh, you know artery in the aorta zone 3 we are looking at zone 3 zone 3 is that well below the renal arteries you occlude the aorta well below the well below the renal arteries so that the kidneys are still perfused and this will cut completely cut off the entire blood supply to the pelvis the lower limbs and it comes with the risks so it is very critical we cannot do this for lengthier time so ribova is only indicated not more than 30 minutes if it is going to be more than 30 minutes you are risking a necrosis of the pelvis and the lower limbs and also so there are other risks comes with the ribova so something like you know rupturing the uh, you know the, the balloon in the aorta causing a traumatic bleed itself so those are the things so ribova is very rarely indi rarely indicated and that is the last measure but you need to be aware that ribova means is a restative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta that is again done by either vascular surgeon or by interventional radiologist and that is only a temporary measure and that can be done only for up to 30 minutes beyond that time so you have to, the patient should be in theater you should release this uh, you know balloon we should have an alternative way to stop that bleeding so let us go to the for the exam sake these are the approaches in the pelvis which you need to be aware of so most of the the you know uh, the anterior aspect of the ring now so we fix with the stop approach please do read what the stop approach and what is modified stop it's all there i won't go into the details this is all it you know you need to be aware and the second one is that ileo inguinal approach it used to be the case until last 3 uh, 4 5 years ago we used to approach all the anterior aspect of the acetabulum using this ileo inguinal approach developing a three windows the theory part is still there they will still ask what are the three windows how do you you know what is in each window so that is also been asked in the exam because most of the people who sits in the examination panel they are not pelvic surgeons many of them are either hand surgeons or lower limb surgeons or upper limb surgeons so but they are all well versed with the exam question ileo inguinal approach three windows so you really have to be knowing this ileo inguinal approach and what are the what are the structures at risk and what are the three windows and what are the you know advantages and disadvantages so that used to be the work uh, horse uh, for anterior aspect of the acetabulum until 3 uh, 4 years ago it's not anymore now the majority 90% of the practicing pelvic surgeons we do the stopa uh, which is a intra uh, uh, intra pelvic approach uh, where we access much better than the ileo inguinal approach very rarely we do the ileo inguinal anymore so just to be aware but please do read these approaches any posterior uh, wall posterior column and uh, anything posterior part of the acetabulum we do do what is called a cocker langen back approach this you need to be aware because most of you do the hip replacement using a posterior approach it's pretty much very close to the same sort of uh, posterior approach to the hip so just read the cocker langen back approach so exactly you need to be aware how to prevent the vascular damage to the femur leg make sure that you read clearly so where to cut this periphonis tendon how much tendon should be left to the to the femur before you cut and what you should not uh, disturb it is mainly there is an ascending branch of lateral circumflex uh, femoral artery which goes just on top of the quadratus femoris you need to be aware of that so that's why you should not disturb that when you do the cocker langen back approach if you cut these uh, two things one is very close to the bone of this piriformis tendon and and if you disturb this the ascending branch they will you will end up with the uh, what is called avascular necrosis so and also again you know where to make a incision uh, over the capsule so not uh, not uh, not to damage the labrum so you need to be aware of that it's all there in the book I don't need to tell so you need to be aware of cocker langen back approach is a very common uh, thing if at all exam they will ask theory you can ask in the approaches uh, surgical approaches in the exam so just have to be aware 
I won't go into the details, you know, the risks of sciatic nerve injury and blah, blah. So it's all there in the book to read. We very rarely used the iliofemoral. Iliofemoral approach, very, very rare. I have hardly seen in my, you know, my fellowship, my training, I've seen you know, only two cases that used to be, the, you know, previously, that is four, five years ago. But we have got various other percutaneous te techniques nowadays to deal with this pelvis. So iliofemoral is a very extensive approach, which can cause a significant uh, muscle damage to the uh, to the abductors and also over the lateral aspect of the you know the, the hip. So significant uh, actual uh, atrotopic ossification. You know, those are the risks. So we, we hardly do those ones. Most commonly now we do percutaneous. The posterior ring is stabilized with the SI joint. Uh, SI joint screw that is called iliosacral screw, which is done percutaneously. So the other one is we do in undisplaced fractures, we do column screws. Then we do something called infix to stabilize the front. I'll show you some x-rays, what they look like. So this is about uh, some brief about theory. So we will go to some discussion now. Uh, so it's the discussion is I'll just put up some x-rays. Uh, so you can ask any questions. Uh, so I can stop it for five minutes. You can have some you know, little drink. So then you can come back. We will go through some X-rays. Uh, so then you can ask me, what do you what do you expect me to sort of you know, tell you a bit more? I can answer you. Or if you okay. want me to give it to uh, you know, Abdullah, I can give it a bit later. Then you can tell me what you need. Uh, so we'll go through some of the x-rays what uh, you know what we normally do okay thank you very much mr kampana I'll, I'll give you a minute or two just to have a bit of water i think you've uh, yes so uh, if you want we can uh, uh, tell you the questions that we've had so far from the audience and please feel free to add more questions please um uh i will uh, if, if if that is okay with you mr kampana Go ahead. Uh, can I just uh, let I let me make it a little bit louder? I can't hear you very. Uh, yes. One second. Let me just. Um, can 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 anyone help? Am I? Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Perfect. Yes, we, Thank you. Yeah, we can. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So, 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 do you do you yeah. mind, Mr. Campana, if we start? No, with some I don't questions? mind at all. Perfect. So I'll I'll I'm give the happy. mic. I'll There's give no the mic. Point me telling a theory. It's a waste. Absolutely. So I'll give the mic to Joe and Hani, who yeah. will take turns in, yeah. in uh, conveying the questions of the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Uh, Campana. It's, it was a very nice talk and uh, very uh, descriptive, actually, to the extent that till now I just have two questions. Uh, the first is, what is the recommended uh, thromboprophylaxis protocol in pelvic fracture? Okay, so the question, the, to answer uh, your question, there is no specific uh, thromboprophylaxis uh, which has been uh, say this is what what the literature says there are many studies come out one is from there are studies from bristol there is yeah. coming from there are studies from royal london i think peter bates is the man who has done some work on it there are bristol two pa two uh, papers are there and uh, there are uh, another one or two uh, from elsewhere i think one from uh, you know derby uh, but the majority, they all looked at, uh, say, St. George's was the originally one of the major trusts which they used to practice this pelvic surgery for long. So they, even today, which is a, being a major trauma center, they practice warfarin. So, and if you go to the, the Royal London, mm -hmm. uh, so I think they use a, they, they use a, a thinzaparin or a low molecular weight heparin. So the okay. Bristol guys, one of the oldest uh, pelvic units, 1998, they established the unit. So they looked at the various things. What is uh, what is most efficient or effective in preventing a VTE? So they looked at it, but there is no consensus on that. But what they come to conclusion is one thing. They looked at it and they come to conclusion that low molecular weight heparin is better than any of these the oral agents, what we use for a hip and knee replacement today. So there are so many hip and knee replacements. We use a you know single dose daily tablets. So you know, epic saban or whatever, so many other things. 
uh, you know, Gabi Gatron and many things, which uh, they all looked at it, but they are not being approved by any you know, body like a nice, or there is no literature to say they are better. But what the, the current literature we have, either from a Bristol study or in the Royal London, and the majority of the literature suggests low molecular weight, heparin is still a better choice than others. So when you want to answer this in the examination, say that there is no consensus, but the literature suggests low molecular weight heparin appears to be you know, much more efficacious than other, other modality. The other ones which you know, the, you know, all these mechanical things, but the, the chemical wise, this is what. And the second thing about this VTE, so the VTE risk is very, very high in these pelvic fractures. That's why the recommended is that as soon as you get the patient into the, your hospital, any trauma center, any DJ, it is recommended that it's efficacious if you give a first dose of your pinzaparin or any form of low molecular weight heparin within 14 hours, if not within 24 hours. If you can't give this within 24 hours, the risk mm -hmm. is very high. Then if you miss the first 24 hours, then you are bound or you are being obliged to do some Dopplers before you undertake any, any major surgery on the pelvis. If you have already a, a clot sitting in the proximal thigh, if you try to do any surgical procedure on the pelvis, you may end up with the pee. So that's why the majority of the patients, you are bound to do this, especially if you miss a first 48 to 72 hours, and uh, you really have to have an ultrasound, the Doppler ultrasound before you do. If you find any clot anywhere in the, in the legs, you are bound to put a IVC filter. So you have to put the IVC filter on. So if you find any DVT, DVT evidence, yeah. So, and uh, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, one more thing, that's a good question you asked. Any polytrauma patient who need a trips to the theater five times, six times, the best bet yes. is to put IVC filter. But IVC filter is not a sort of benign thing. You need to be aware. IVC filter needs to be removed. Okay. If you don't remove the IVC filter, that itself has got a lot of main downsides. There is a radiologist, uh, interventional radiologist advice is there. You need to try and get this IVC filter out, ideally within three months, if not, not more than, you know, you can't leave it more than six months. If you leave it six months, you can't retrieve it. Then you end you are, you ended up end up with the sort of uh, anticoagulate that man or a patient for lifelong. So you have to be aware of these protocols. But the evidence suggests within 24 hours you need to give a thromboprophylaxis, especially low molecular weight. But they, they across the country, as I said, warfarin is used in some of the centers. There are uh, you know this uh, current. Uh, uh, though in you know, a daily dose uh, anticoagulants which we use for hip and knee, including aspirin, they are being used in some places. There is no consensus, but this is what the evidence says. Is that answers my? Is that answers? Yeah. Yes, uh, totally answer the uh, the question. The second question is that what approach would you use for pelvic packing? Is it the uh, finished steel or you need a bigger one? So that is a, another good question. So this is where your forward thinking or a critical thinking comes into picture. So for me to do a normal uh, stabular fracture, say anterior wall, or quadrilateral plate fracture or anterior column fracture, I use a, a phenom steel with the splitting the uh, rectus in the midline. But I, in this case, I will not do. The pelvis hacking, I will not do that. The reason is that in case if this patient needs a laparotomy, what would you do? So yes. I would do a midline skin incision from umbilicus down all the way to the pubic symphysis. I would do split the uh, rectus in the midline and the linea alba. Then I will pack it front and back. So here it's very easy. You've got a pelvic fracture, pretty much uh, the part of the rectus is almost you know, damaged already. As soon as you open the skin, most of the time you see that it is uh, pelvis is in front of you. So is that, is that answer? So I would use the midline. This yes. is just a clear reason is that 
in case if you need a laparotomy they can extend upwards yeah. so rather than me, me me making a transverse incision and the general surgeon comes and do a, a vertical incision which makes a p which is not a good idea yes thank okay. you i have i have another yeah. question if that's okay so what yeah, is this, the, the diameter of pins of the xfx you use sorry I, I can't hear what is the diameter of pins ah. of the xfx yeah you yeah, see so probably you missed that my uh, thing earlier so if the patient is thin and a, and a lady who is a very thin lady and the bones are expected to be a, a thin and a small i would use a 5 mm if the patient is a in a male who is you know fairly fairly you know decent sized man it would use either 5.5 or a 6 mm depends on what is available so 6 is a very preferable one in a man so you just have to use a normal uh, just have to use a normal uh, external fixator pins don't don't need anything but if you are looking to use that as a definitive fixation you could use a ha coated pins hydroxyapatite coated pins a less risk of infection and they grip the they integrate or they grip with the bone for you know for a better way so otherwise use a you know offman x fix sand pins Okay, I have another question from another yeah. candidate. So, what's the Go ideal ahead. time for operative management? So, this is what I said. Please do read a, please do read a BOST guidelines. BOST guidelines has got a 19 points. It clearly says. Okay. So, the pelvic ring injuries. The, so, the almost any pelvic fractures are being classified clearly as a pelvic ring injury, or a acetabular injury, or a combination. So whenever you come across a pelvic ring, ring injury, which is an unstable pattern, usually as per the BOA guidelines and as per the research and the evidence, clearly suggests you should stabilize the ring within 72 hours. And if you see this patient in a remote DGH, you can stabilize the patient temporarily with some x fix you should make a, all the arrangements to be transferred to the local mpc or a pelvic unit within sort of 24 hours safely with a view to stabilize this pelvis within 70 the ring 72 hours whereas a stabular fractures is a different scenario so you can go up to 7 7 days of course the you know fracture dislocations of the acetabulum needs to be reduced put it in a put it in a fraction the other thing about uh, for your question, just to be aware, whenever you see a vertical uh, shear injury, which I'll, which will go through, whenever you see these ones, even if you are in a DGH, you know you need to put a pelvic binder. Along with the pelvic binder, you need to put a skeletal traction to pull that hemi pelvis down. Okay, this is a most minimum you should do. So, is that answers or are you? Yeah, not clear. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you, Mr. Kapana. I think that was the last question. So we'll go sure. now to the interactive uh, teaching. I have one. You have one? Okay. So yeah, go I have one. one. <laughs> so uh, if you have moral level uh, lesion associated with pelvic fracture, what is your advice about that? So the moral level lesion is, you know, I don't know how many of you are aware, it is nothing but an internal degloving. So you, the internal, you've got an intact skin, very bruised. But uh, if you look at the internally, there is a uh, quite a bit of uh, damage to the underlying soft tissue. So that is a moral level lesion. So moral level lesion depends on where your moral level lesion is and what type of fracture. So every time, whenever you see, even forget about the pelvic fracture, you may see this moral level lesion even in your hip fractures. So hip fracture, you can see this moral level lesion many times. So whenever you see, what is that signify? That signifies the soft tissues are at risk. You need to try and avoid going there if possible. If not, please do explain clearly the risk of high risk of infection plus wound breakdown and other soft tissue risks. You've got to be aware, if you can't avoid going through the moral level lesion, you can go through, make sure that you, know, you take a, enough precautions to avoid a further damage as little as possible 
to the surrounding soft tissue where the blood flow comes in that direction. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, um, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Campana, I've got no, actually just a, just a follow-on question. Yeah. You know, you asked about the thrombophylaxis of the um, for the fractures. We don't we don't have a consensus. What is your personal practice for the fractures which you already fixed and patient is now going to be mobile and go home with, uh, or the fracture which are in, inherently stable and would they require um, any further extended prophylaxis for it? For how okay. long? Yeah, that is a very good question again. See, my practice, I am always, uh, you know, practice what is based on the evidence. So I won't go anything out of that evidence. I use the low molecular weight. So if the patient, if he is a non-weight bearing, I would go up to six weeks of the, the thromboprophylaxis. What the literature says, what the hematologist says, there is no evidence even if the patient is not able to wait where even after six weeks, there is no evidence that if you continue beyond six weeks of your thromboprophylaxis, it's not going to make any difference. So you give a thromboprophylaxis or not, after six weeks, it is not, not much of use. Okay. So okay. that's why majority of these thromboprophylaxis has been given. You know, if you look at this, uh, there is a nice guideline if you want to read. If you are practicing in UK, there is a nice guideline only for a fragility pelvic fracture. That is, nice says, you have to give it for four weeks. That's, that is sufficient enough. But in my practice, I just go by whatever the available literature, which says six weeks, six weeks of low molecular weight uh, heparin. Yeah, because in the east of England, we actually practice um, uh, rivaroxaban 10 milligram, as you said about this, um, for 70 days. That's the practice from the Edinburghs. So I'm not sure how, have... how it is um, research driven, but it, that's what they normally run with. So that's, I just yeah. want to give actually a bit of an example for the one of the MTCs practicing this. Yeah, I, I, I suspect uh, Jay Rawal must be doing a trial there, I would imagine. <laughs> so he's, he's, uh, he's such, such sort of, you know, very dynamic yeah. person. So, That's but the, there is no literature to say that uh, Rivaroxaban, exactly right. he's, uh, he's been allowed for a trauma patients, even by the NICE. So there is no literature to suggest or to help. Why I don't practice, I have seen the people doing it. If something goes wrong tomorrow, you have to you know, sort of uh, back defend it up. yourself. Yeah, back it up, yeah. You have something to stand on your legs. That's I know right. there are guys who does it. That is, you know, they are ready to sort of either do a trial. Maybe they, it may it may come a big standard private some practice later on. They may say that is the best thing in in in, a, in a years down the line. But we don't know. So until something happens, so we'll stick to that. What is being available? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, anything else? Okay, so I think um, that is enough for the questions for the time being. We will uh, need to leave some time for the candidates to get into the interactive part of the session. Um, I will leave that with uh, Mr. Hinari Shwan, our uh, uh, colleague. Um, Mike is yours. Thank you. Um, so at the moment, we've only one volunteer. Please do volunteer because the interactive section, uh, session is not like our Viva session. It's uh, just a friendly chat to try and improve uh, your presentation and to 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 make this a, a more interesting topic. Uh, sorry, an interesting topic. Uh, that Sean, can you uh, speak a little bit louder, Sean? I, I, I can't get my apologies. Some are probably letting me. Sorry, some problem. Yeah. So at the moment, only Mohammed Mudassar has uh, volunteered. Uh, yeah. Please, uh, others, please do volunteer because we are uh, looking to make a robust interactive section session. So yeah, uh, just just to uh, you know reassure these uh, you know, people who are in this uh, webinar, this is not an exam. This is not testing anybody's knowledge. This is more of a learning. Learning for you. It's learning for me. Don't don't think that it is any question. I'm not going to ask. It is just to show some of these uh, you know real cases what we what we come across, how they can be managed. Don't, don't think that we, we are doing anything to test your knowledge. Don't, don't worry. 
Okay, we have uh, more volunteers have come on. So we'll start with Mohammed uh, Mudassar um, and then we'll move on to the others. Oh, that's okay. So shall we just go for the next first one? Yeah, Mohammed Mudassar, if you could unmute un yeah. un uh, and speak a little so we yeah. can see you. Yeah, I have. So yeah. Mohammed, uh, look at these uh, images. So we've got a, you know, sort of, uh, I would say, uh, he's only 58, I think, 58 or 68, I've forgotten exactly. So, see this, this is, uh, this is, you can see that, what is this exactly? This is a, a CT angiogram, this 3D CT angiogram of a pelvis, uh, which shows a fracture of the right uh, uh, sacroiliac joint at the level of its ileum and probably it is going into the sacroiliac joint as well um, and uh, uh, I do not appreciate any fracture at the anterior pelvic rim anterior pelvis uh, no there is there is one on the uh, uh, left pubic rim eye fracture there is a fracture over there so it's uh, lateral compression type three fracture. So you, you heard me telling that two or three times I repeated. Type three means you are looking either bilateral or pubic ramus, bilateral. Yeah, yeah. It's, so is this a bilateral pubic ramus? No, no, it's, it's type uh, 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 lateral compression type two. Isha, what, what makes you to think this is a type two? Because I told you only one word. That just one word will stop the examiner to ask you further. Because it's only one uh, uh, it's fracture on the one side of the pubic uh, remai. It's one. Well, that, that is the case in LC1 as well. What made you to say it is LC2? Because there is a fracture on the posterior ileum as well. What is that called? That is the word you need to use. Only one word you need to use. Uh, this is called a crescent fracture. Crescent fracture. So whenever you see the fracture of this ileum, you can see that the part of this uh, ileum still left over with the SI joint. Mm -hmm. This is like a crescent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you see a fracture in front of the SI joint here, or very adjacent to the SI joint, that is called a crescent fracture. This is a pathognomonic or very characteristic of type two lateral compression, type two injury. Okay. Yeah. And if you see a bilateral a pubic rami in front of it, yeah. along with this, then it becomes a type three. Yeah. If you okay. see a only unilateral pubic rami fracture, then it is, it is just a type two. So here, so the anterior ring fracture is there in the. CT axial and the coronal cuts. I only just put this is very obvious to just show that this is a crescent fracture. Mm -hmm. When there is a very undisplaced fracture in the axial and the coronal cuts in a CT scan, they don't come up in the 3D 3D images. You just have to be aware. Is this is it a, a, C, a 3D uh, CT angio? Because I can see the vessels. Is it angio or is it just a 3D? I think it's 3D. No, th this is not a CT. Angio, this is called a contrast CT. Okay. So they put a contrast. So that this is what we do. Whenever we get a patient who has got a hemodynamically unstable, we do contrast CT. That gives an idea whether there is an arterial bleed. Okay. The contrast will be leaky. So if it is not, then we know that it is a venous bleed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is a type 2. LC2, mm -hmm. and you see that you can see here, you can see here. So what is this one here? Uh, this is... Uh, what is this one? This is the sciatic notch. So that is a greater sciatic notch. Yeah. So what is this one here? You said the... Superior the gluteal of, superior That gluteal. is a superior gluteal artery. Superior gluteal artery at risk. Mm. Is that clear? Yeah. So you can see that uh, you know yeah. the vessels are it outlined there. 
So this is a you know type two type two injury. So how do we manage this one? So I will manage this patient according to ATLS and BOST guidelines. Uh, I will uh, assumingly that uh, there is no uh, airway breathing as a problem. Uh, I would uh, um, uh, take the uh, two large IV lines, taking the bloods, blood for grouping and cross matching, and starts the IV fluids. Um, and then I will. Uh, 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 examine the, the pelvis, abdomen, and long bones uh, for any bleeding. Um, uh, if this is the only diagnosis, I would uh, 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 apply a pelvic binder uh, at the level of the greater trochanter. Um, and uh, 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 acco according to the blood pressure and pulse, she, he may need blood transfusion as well. Um, and I will uh, talk to uh, my major trauma center um, uh, and uh, uh, if possible, I will shift it to major trauma center, plan uh, shift to the major trauma center. Uh, I may have to apply the external fixator if there is, uh, uh, if, uh, there is a time between the shifting. Mohammed, okay, that's fine. So you said uh, all the correct steps. So this patient is uh, hemodynamically unstable. You already transfused a uh, two liters of uh, normal saline or finger lactate and a unit of blood. It's uh, still unstable. And you have applied the binder. Okay. I will, <clears throat> I will uh, uh, also give uh, uh, transemic acid. Um, and uh, 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 this patient uh, may need uh, um, uh, pelvic uh, uh, um, packing uh, uh, and external fixator as well. Uh, I would uh, like to apply the external fixator in the theater, um, uh, which uh, there are different external fixator type. I will apply the anterior external fixator and I uh, will um, apply, uh, I will do the packing uh, as well. So shall I just stop you there, Mohammed? I'll just yeah. have to stop you there. The reason yeah. is that um, I told you this is a LC2 fracture. And the LC2 fracture is, as you, I, I said also, that there is an undisplaced fracture in the front, which is can't even see here. The only fracture, which is obvious, is here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you already applied the binder. The patient is still unstable. What is that suggests? That there is some bleeding going on still. Where? This is what this is. Venous. Venous. So is the is this is a LC2 type of fracture. This is not even a sacral fracture. <coughs> so there will be some bleed from this uh, bleeding surface, iliac crest, mm -hmm. maybe some venous bleeding. So what should come into mind? This is what the examiner always. You have to think broadly, Mohammed. Mm -hmm. So don't assume pelvis is the only source of uh, bleeding. Which you clearly early, earlier asked, what is this vessel, which is a the superior gluteal artery, which seems to be intact here. It might have been a little bit stretched, but there will be some bleeding. You already applied the binder, and the pelvis is closed, and you have restated with the one or two units of blood and some fluid. You need to think broadly. There are other places to bleed. There could be intrathoracic, abdominal, so bleed. retroperitoneal bleed it can be a chest bleed which has not been picked up. It can be bleed anywhere. So you need to make sure before you, you go and pack the pelvis and things, make sure that you exclude the other source of bleeding. So which are a closed cavities. Yeah? Yeah. So this is a LC2. LC2 fractures can bleed but they are very rare to bleed onto death. So it is a LC3 very rarely, otherwise vertical shear or APC3. APC3 and vertical shear. Yeah? Yeah. So what would you do for this one? Anyway, if I ask you just uh, isolated fracture, patient is stable, what would you do? Uh, uh, this uh, will uh, uh, need a uh, fixation. Uh, uh, you can do the posterior uh, uh, ileum plating or 
uh, or the screws, uh, uh, compression screws. Uh, so you do which one? I will do the plating. So you would I, do the plating? Ilium plating because plate it's- Plate in the front, plate in the back, or where exactly you want to plate? Uh, I will plate at the back, with the ilium at the back. Yeah. Uh, you know, the crescent uh, and the- uh, um... So uh, just let me tell you. So the whole uh, purpose here is to stabilize the ring. Yeah. Anteriorly, as I said, there is hardly, you can see any fracture. So here you've got the two options. Option one is that you plate this, the iliac crest fracture. The reason is that this fracture very likely that either extends into the SI joint or SI joint is unstable by definition. Mm -hmm. So, and the fracture is widely displaced. So you got the option. One is to plate this fracture from the front, then to stabilize the SI joint percutaneously with the screw. The reason I won't just do screw is that, <coughs> so the screw entry point almost in there where I'm pointing myself. Mm -hmm. So you see that this is a completely flyall fly -all fragment. So you have to first make the two fragments into one fragment. You see there? So you make the two fragments into one fragment with the plates. Okay. Then you go and put a screw, either it can go through there because you already joined, you already made this as a one, one, one bowl. Either it can go there. If, if sometimes you may have to go through here. If you don't plate it, if you go here, don't, it doesn't serve any purpose. It doesn't give any stability. That's why in an elderly patient, so yeah. they see that because of the osteoporosis, the screws are slightly backing out in some of them, but they are not causing any trouble for him. They're just keeping a close eye on it. But the fracture is healed. He is fully mobile. He is back to work. But we just keep an eye because the metal work is getting loose. If it get loose, we'll have to take it out at some point. It's just yeah. more than six months or more than eight months now. He doesn't have any complaints. He just comes for a routine follow. -up. So let us go to the next one. Mr. Kumar, uh, this we did not do anything at the front because it is an undisplaced fracture, so we don't need to do anything. Uh, for rehabilitation wise, he, 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 how long you will keep him non weight bearing? So, if you see that, uh, you know, on the right side SI joint is the key here. Mm -hmm. Whenever you stabilize the right side SI joint with the, the screw, so ideally, I would leave them non-weight bearing or a toe touch weight bearing for six weeks. So if the screw and the SI joint still looks good, after six weeks, no restriction, I let them fully weight bear. Yeah, okay. the key of the thing is that your SI joint. Anteriorly, if it is displaced, I would just put an infix. Infix is a percutaneous procedure, which majority of the people, you know, they will keep it under the skin they won't even see, they are walking. Many of them have even forgotten. Some of my patients are, you know, working with that for more than six months now. They will not come back. So just to be aware in case if I, or there is something called a column screws. So if the fracture is, uh, let me just, if the fracture is just lateral to this, you know, this is the obturator foramen. If the fracture is uh, lateral to this obturator foramen in this area, we could do even a percutaneous column screw, which I'll show you a bit later. So one of the options is a percutaneous column screw. If it is undisplaced, if it is a displaced, I can plate it. I can go open and I can plate all the way, or I can do percutaneous, the infix, which I will show you some of the slides next. So uh, can you read me, what is this one? <coughs> so uh, there's a question about, um, so about lateral compression fractures, we were talking earlier on about the indications for uh, using the bra uh, sorry, pelvic br uh, brace. One second, Martin. Um, in this situation- sorry, sorry, I couldn't catch the question. Using pel pelvic uh, braces um, for lateral compression fractures, what are the indications in those situations? So I, I told you to pass the exam, if it is LC1 fracture, 
say it is a stable majority or stable treat it conservatively if the patient is elderly frail weight bear is tolerated just repeat the x ray at one week and again at six weeks mm. usually the pelvic ring or you got a three views ap inlet and outlet these three views you need to be aware of for a pelvic ring for acetabular fractures you need to do what is called jude views j u d e t please do read them and uh, you know you can go through or if you want me to there are some x rays which you can you can look at it bit later we will will go i can show you what this jude view is uh, what is inlet outlet views so is that is that the answer sorry sorry mr uh, kapana uh, my name is amjit uh, no shuan i think was saying that is there any contraindication contraindication for using the pelvic binder no no there is as i said either it can be vertical shear injury it can be lateral compression injury it can be apc any type there is no contraindication there is no literature says even if it is a lateral compression injury you can still put it on it may not help but still you can put it on there is no contraindication unless it is a you got a very big uh, you know open wounds or you got a very damaged skin or you know patient is very stable hemodynamically you don't need one that is the one the one but i don't think there is any contraindication yeah i agree with you thank you yeah. just you know, they, they were asking sorry they, that was one of the questions being asked so i just wanted to clarify that that there's no no contraindication thank you amjit for clearing that up I, my, yeah, there, there's no contraindication they will criticize you if you don't apply exactly but they won't criticize you if you apply Brilliant. thank you um right. should we move on to the next uh, candidate uh, yeah. uh aj shirosi if you turn your camera and your mic on that we appreciate that thank you thank you and we ask the other guys who are not participating to mute their mics again mute your mic please yeah go ahead yeah please so uh, i can see it's a limited uh, one section of the ct which is coronal uh, image which is showing the uh, coronal section part of the lower lumbar spine uh, uh, and the part of the pelvis and the right side of the uh, uh, acetabulum the uh, proximal femur uh, on the left side i can see there is a, a, a increased space between the si joint and also there is a step in the sacroiliac joint and uh, the, i will check the further uh, sections and check if there is any other, other injury i am suspecting probably it's in a maybe a lateral compression or anterior posterior compression which involving the, uh, uh, the extensively on the left side so what's what's going through your mind what's going oh. through your mind if you you only answered now but you are contradicting yourself yeah. you answered so, first you said yeah. that uh, there is a mismatch here yeah it's a mismatch there so it may be a uh, uh, vertical uh, shear uh, kind of injury or it may be a uh, uh, lateral compression which involved uh, which may be a lateral compression type 3 injury which uh, involved the anterior as well as the posterior complete injury okay that's fine what is this one there so it's uh, yeah it's it uh, looks like that is the uh, axial image of the uh, same same patient and there is a uh, opening of the posterior sacroiliac joint uh, uh, completely An excellent and also yeah. widening of the anteriorly as well yeah so see this one now same yeah, so that is the uh, 3d reconstruction uh the uh, and uh, i can obviously see there is a uh, uh spivix emphysis is not only open there the step as well which is up and down and uh, on the left side uh, the inferior pubic rami fracture as well and the uh, posteriorly there is a it's is uh, there is a step on the sacroiliac joint so uh it 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 may be a lateral compression or it may be a vertical shear uh, injury so i told you what is lateral compression why how to differentiate vertical shear pure vertical shear versus lateral compression type 3 so pure vertical shear uh, there is a the superior migration of the uh, uh, the superior inferior migration of the uh, along with the fracture 
and a type three is the uh, both anterior posterior part of the sacral uh, like ligaments are gone or along with the uh, they both ligaments gone and also there is anterior fracture yeah so whenever you see whenever you see this pubic lymphosis diastasis there is no fracture here no fracture here no fracture here so it's it a, is a, it's an open book it's an open book uh, uh, type 3 which is, a, is open book type three, three, but it is not right. exactly open book type 3 yeah. because it is me pelvis is vertically shifted up here yes so in in uh, in open book type 3 you see a wide opening and you see a gap as well but there is no shift in there yeah the me pelvis is not shifted up so here it is clearly you can see that it is upward shift of the left me pelvis so this is one of those classical vertical me uh, you know vertical shear injury yeah so how do you manage that so uh, obviously is the uh, as per the atls guidelines i will uh, assess and uh, treat the patient and as per the post guidelines i will uh, make sure that he's got airway uh, oxygenation and cervical cervical spine is immobilized and uh, uh, if that is secured then i'll uh, go further to uh, look for breathing if that is secured uh, sec uh, that is fine then i'll progress further to uh, C part, which is the uh, bleeding part. Look for the bleeding, uh, examine from the top to bottom and check if there is any associated injury. It may be a chest injury, it may be intraabdominal, abdominal or head injury as well, which may bleed or is there any open fracture or any long bone so fracture. Let us stop there. So just uh, uh, imagine this is an isolated injury and uh, it is in one of the DGHR. The patient comes at around uh, in 11 o'clock in the night. So uh, this patient, if it is isolated injury, it's a uh, vertical shear injury. The mortality is quite high. So uh, because of the bleeding, so I will resuscitate extensively this patient and start with the uh, illegal uh, after taking the bloods, uh, including rope and sieve. I will give the IV fluids and uh, may need probably few units of transfusion and sometime uh, lead up to the uh, mossy transfusion in this case if there is a further bleeding. And uh, I will... Uh, uh, apply the pelvic binder as well and uh, stabilize the patient and uh, I will be in touch with the local uh, trauma uh, center, uh, major trauma center or the pelvic surgeon as well. And uh, once patient assessed, I will scan further to uh, look out for uh, if any other injury is still uh, uh, causing the bleeding. So that Friday night that the local pelvic surgeon is drunk and uh, is not to be contacted, what would you do? So uh, I will... Uh, I will see the patient whether it's stabilized or not hemodynamically. If it is not, then I, I'm suspecting that he's still bleeding uh, despite applying the pelvic binder. So I will take this patient uh, after taking his consent to the theater and apply the external fixator, and uh, which is uh, the common one is they putting the two pin on the both the anterior uh, behind the anterior superior leg spine and connecting with the uh, external fixator to stabilize this temporarily. And again, I will be in touch uh, with the uh, local uh, major trauma yeah. center, the pelvic so, surgeon. Yeah, so what they expect you to look at is that you applied a binder correctly, you have closed the thing, but you see that this is a vertical shear. So what the bleeding sources are, bleeding sources are, one is veins, other one is bleeding surfaces. See that the SI joint here, it is wide open. It's going up, yeah. Yeah, so you need to pull this leg down so you need to put a distal femoral traction. So you put a distal femoral traction, put the binder on, you know, under the fluoroscopy, try and put the you know, a weight so that it comes down, then close the you have to close it with the binder and rest it. So then the further steps, you need to be aware of massive transmission protocols if need be. And but then you can ask for advice. Hmm? Sorry, yeah. turning turning uh, turn acid as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's all. I, so you are speaking about tranexamic acid. What is the evidence you have? Uh, I think there was a, some trial. I forgot the which year. I think it's 2018 or something. Which uh, uh, it is called crash two trial. Crash, a crash two trial. Yes. Yeah. So what is that says? It says that if it is given within one hour and then followed by eight hours and. Uh, uh, three doses, then it reduces the bleeding and reduces the mortality. Are you sure? Whenever you answer, make sure that you know correctly. If you don't know, please don't answer. 
So the answer, as far as I am aware, you should give a tranexamic acid ideally within an hour, if not within three hours maximum. If you give a tranexamic acid after three hours, it increases the mortality rate. Is that clear? Don't yeah. say eight hours, which I am not aware. I may be wrong. Go and look at it again. Rash two trial says clearly within maximum time you are allowed is three hours. Anything after three hours, no benefit. In fact, it causes increased mortality. Yeah. So exam. So be careful if the examiner knows clearly, he can just pull you down. Yeah. yeah. So very good. So. Yeah, just to you know, show you this is what we do. So we got this, uh, you know, we put the traction on on the left side, which has been pulled down. The leg has been pulled down. You can see that the, the side and this is the AP view of the pelvis. If somebody wants to sort of be aware, so this is the iliopectineal line here. This represents the anterior column. Okay, column. Then this is the ischial line. This represents the posterior column here. So. Then you got this uh, you know, posterior wall here, and this is called the dome here, dome of the establum. I'll just go some some more views down below. So this is called an inlet view. Inlet view. Yeah. So you are seeing the pelvis from above. Yeah. So what this is useful is to see that there is no anterior posterior displacement. Okay. See that? So this is pretty much, you see that whole, whole pelvic ring. Pelvic ring, yeah. Yeah, it's quite clear here, yeah? Yes. So, and you are seeing this sacrum here, S1, yeah. top of the sacrum, you are looking from above. See that? Yeah. So that is the anterior margin of the sacrum there, and you got the posterior margin there, you got the spinal canal on the back. So, and you are seeing the pelvis from above. So this is an inlet view to assess the anterior posterior displacement, yeah? So if you got that uh, that two screws there, which you saw in the AP, a bit overlap, that's what we expect. Yeah. This is all well aligned. This is called an outlet view. Outlet view, yeah. Yeah, so outlet view tells whether there is a vertical shift. So that gives a good idea about the SI joint. These X-rays are not very clear, but uh, that is what is it meant to be. And also that shows that you see that the foramen are here, two foramen, so we have avoided and put the screws percutaneously. So, and also it will tell us how much long the screws are. They are still inside the bone, they are not outside the bone. Okay, so next one. So just to go through the next one quickly, see that this is another x-ray, uh, another polytrauma. So this is how the patient uh, had a CT scan. This is very interesting. Have a look at it. Can you see anything much happening there? This sorry, the uh, sorry. just a second, Mr. Campana. Yeah. Uh, Shwan, do we have a third candidate just to distribute the benefit for everyone? Uh, Shwan? I think it's Asif. Asif, okay. So, so sorry, AJ. Um, it's just to give a chance no, to no, other people like, to no benefit. Problem, no problem, please, yeah. Thank you very much. So Asif, uh, are you on? Can you unmute yourself and uh, put the um, video on, please, Asif? It's fine. Excellent. Hi. Yes, Mr. Campana. Sorry, the floor is yours. Sorry. So the, this is a, again a, a polytrauma who came, uh, who had a CT scan. This is what the CT scan is. So can you see anything much here or? Uh, this is a CT scan. I can see the lateral side. I can see iliopectineal line, uh, but on the right hand side, I cannot see much. So I need to go through the proper coronal and sagittal sections and then I can comment on it. I can see there is a small flake fracture on the top of the right sacroiliac area. I'm concerned about the anterior, so I need to go through again more axial sections and coronal sections. Uh, one second, I'll uh, walk smart. Uh, five minutes. Um, okay. Definitely. So, you are very good, actually. You picked up uh, very nicely, which uh, is not being picked up by one of the, uh, not our hospital, it's uh, elsewhere. One of the external reporting radiologists couldn't pick it up. You picked up very nicely. Very good. Excellent. So, what is this happening? What else you can see here? 
So there is something going on in the in the in the right sacroiliac joint area. It could be anteroposterior disruption. Could be type two, uh, or uh, could be type three. So I need to look at the front that there is no opening up of the anterior sacroiliac joint, which is fine, looks fine. It is less than two point five centimeter. So I need to look at the <clears throat> Um, more detail, uh, I mean, the sagittal sections. Uh, this is a, this is an axial cut that gives, I don't know what you are expecting in a sagittal. There is nothing in the sagittal view. So it is disruption of sacroiliac joint. Uh, I have to assess the patient. I will follow the ATLS protocol, uh, do the primary and secondary survey, uh, and I will make sure that uh, the patient has no neurological deficit. That's okay. That's all done. What uh -huh. else? Uh, what else comes in your picture here? What else? You can see that. This is a CT scan. Just you can see anything else? I'm concerned on the right hand side. There is uh, in the iliac bone. There is some disruption. Where? Here? No. There is a little bit you which you already picked up. No, on the left hand side. I mean, on the left hand side in the center. Yeah, somewhere down. Uh, no, that's all. It's all okay. You can see that. What is this one? Here? So there is a pelvic binder. Oh, the pelvic binder applied already. So it means this could be the misleading. So what happens when we apply the pelvic binder? It compresses. It brings back all the structures. So it uh, gives you a false impression. And I can see on this section that there is sacral ilia, uh, there is ilic wing fracture, uh, ilian fracture. So, so there is. It is, a, it is a part of, yeah, yeah, I agree. There is a small uh, fracture there. But you have seen the front already, which I showed you. Yeah. So just, uh, just uh, so this is what the, this is a, one of the missed uh, cases. You can see that clearly. Yeah. So what is the, these are the telltale signs. You can see that. Um, anterior SI joint ligament is avulsed here. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of the binder, somebody has put the binder in such a nice way, it is completely closed. Yeah. If you go here, so the guy is in a lot of pain. They took out the binder saying that everything is normal. So see that, what is this? Yeah, so on AP view, I can see there is opening of uh, symphysis pubis. It is nearly, 2.5 centimeters or so. And looking back with the sacroiliac joint involvement, it is type two anteroposterior compression injury. Yeah. So if the patient is hemodynamically stable, then uh, I will transfer these images to the local regional center yeah. and take their advice. So this is one of the, in the burst guidelines, it is there. This is what I, why, what I'm showing in this X-ray is that you need to have a, an X-ray out of binder, especially because all these polytrauma patients get a CT scan in binder, majority. But it should be done in the theater, uh, you know. No. So what happens is that when the patient comes to a &E, they do CT scan, trauma CT. So they do put the binder on. Once the patient is resuscitated there in a &E, so you can slowly release the binder. If the CT is normal at that stage, we need to take an X-ray out of binder. Right. So the see that this is a clear example. So only some telltale signs are there. The pubis is well closed. So this is what happened uh, in uh, in one of the one of the hospitals because it's not been picked up. Patient uh, was being left like that with a lot of pain, thinking that there is nothing wrong. So this is not being picked up. So this needed further. This is a classical type two. APC. So, you see that? Yeah. So I can see that it is anteriorly fixed with the reconstruction plate with the with the screws, and on the back it is fixed uh, with the iliosacral screw bilaterally. I suppose it's percutaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's correct. So I am taking your time too much. So let us just go a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Anybody can look at it. So Sorry, this is, is again. Uh... Is this the next case, uh, Mr. Campana? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Asif. Um, this is the next case. I think the last one, I think, is Danish Altaf. Danish Altaf, yes. Yes. Danish, are you. Can you unmute yourself? And... Yeah, yeah, I've unmuted myself. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Danish. Okay, yes, Mr. Campana. 
Yeah, so this is another uh, polytrauma. You know, you can see that this is a CT coronal views. Anything you can see clearly? Yeah, from this uh, CT scan, I can see there is a uh, an opening of the uh, sacroiliac joint, and uh, so the sacroiliac joint is here. That is not open. So you see. Oh, and there is a fracture of the up. yeah fracture in the sacrum, is, uh, probably yeah. in zone one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in further uh, in these uh, sections, uh, this fracture, uh, I can see the fracture more clearly now, and it, it might be involving sacral foramina as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, it could be, and there's so uh, it's a little bit of opening there. So what is this one then? So. Uh, Sacral, but I, I've not seen any uh, further images to see the anterior injury. Uh, uh, yeah, I think um, probably uh, I probably missed. Yeah, okay, you can see here actually. So you can see the anterior injury here. Yeah. So it's a uh, and it's it's a unilateral rami fracture with the sacral fracture. So it looks it's a LC two. Uh, LC2 comp little compression uh, fracture of uh, yeah, this is a little pelvis. confusing for you because we don't have a, in a proper uh, you know, cuts uh, have. there is a there is an undisplaced crack which is going on here there is a fracture which you can see okay so if there bilateral, is, yeah so if there's a bilateral, bilateral uh, sacral fracture so this is a classical LC3 LC3 yeah if bilateral, so you can see that it's all been stabilized with the percutaneous screws on the back yeah and this and is what the picture. infix was. This is all a right. infix, which is a percutaneous. Right. So you don't have to make a very big cuts, small cut. This is a spinal pedicle screw goes in there. Yeah. The one there, suprastabular X-fix area. Yeah. And connect it with the, the percutaneous rod. So yeah. usually we take them off after four months. So you see that already patient probably started healing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thank you. Um, thank you, Danish. So yeah. I think so, these are the only candidates who volunteered so that's far. Okay. Mr. I'll Kampana. just show the one more X-ray. Yes, so of I course. just wanted to say the all the you know APC two LC three uh, these X-rays. So this is another uh, you know, another patient high velocity, young lad again. You see that uh, the significant uh, you know, injury. So this is what I was trying to show. The anterior column is fractured here. Posterior column again that is also fractured means it's both the columns are gone. So, and the fracture is high up here. So it's a, so you need to be aware of the establer classification. They're all been uh, totally, totally 10 types which in, been described by Jude. So there are five elementary type. That means a only single fracture line, five of them. And the five of them, another five of them has got a more than one fracture line. They are called an associated type. There are two types, totally 10, four, 5 plus 5, each in each group, 5. So you just have to be aware. So you can see that um, this patient, in fact, has got uh, some fracture around uh, or a SI joint widening plus the associate both column you can see there. So you see that the SI joint is you know, pretty much wide open here, or uh, maybe some sacral fracture here. So a significant ostabular fracture, see there. So that is again uh, fixed, the, the, the ostabular is fixed with the head back. And see that the head is back in place. It's one of those two plate called suprapectineal plate, which we use to you know, push this head out. Yeah, there's some plates which we put to, you know, so the SI joint is stabilized with the screw. The column uh, fractures or iliac crest fractures are plates all the way. So significant pelvic ring and stabular fractures. This is another one. This is just to show that uh, this uh, undisplaced fracture here, this is a column fracture on the left side. So obvious there. So again, this undisplaced fracture in here, undisplaced fracture here, you can see that. So they can be managed uh, with the, what is called a you know, column screws. So 
So this is the AP view. You can see that this is the anterior column, but this clue is in the posterior column. <coughs> I'll show you. So this is in the anterior column, that is in the posterior column. Look at the next one. So this is uh, here, this is the iliac oblique view. Iliac oblique view shows your posterior column. See that this entire thing is posterior column. It is the scale spine, it is the scale tuberosity, that is the posterior column. The screw is in the posterior column. So the anterior column is overlapped here. And this is again the posterior column of the opposite side. So look at the next one. So this is the anterior column. So that screw is in the anterior column. That screw is in the posterior column. Here you can see that that is in the posterior column. So undisplaced fractures we manage with the percutaneous, percutaneous uh, things. So any questions, uh, guys? Sorry, I kept you for long. No, actually, thank you very much, Mr. Campana. That was a lot of dedication of you. This was very informative. And um, I think people need to digest it. So they probably need <laughs> to listen to it a couple of times because you've you've covered it really, really nicely. Um, fine. Uh, guys, this is the chance of you. If you have any further questions, uh, this is your last chance to ask because the next bit will be the Viva. I think we have time only for one candidate for the Viva. Um, unless everyone is tired and if you want the Viva, please, the people who volunteered for the Viva, you are allowed to withdraw if you want, if you feel tired and exhausted. If you still want to go for it, just raise your hand on the uh, near your name on the participant. Abdullah, they all need a food, actually. I think so. I think so. But because we promised some people that I would like them to to you know, withdraw yeah. rather than me apologize to them. Uh, uh, yeah. I think all, all four of them, all four, uh, four of them actually has uh, been involved in the interactive talk. Fair so, enough. Yeah, so. Perfect. If that is the case, then what remains is to apologize for everyone for doing, uh, for cutting it short for the Viva. But I think that was worth it because this talk is very important. And as you can see from from this, it, it can branch into many aspects. It can go into Massive hemorrhagic protocol, it can branch into ATLS, both guidelines, fracture classification, stabilization, thinking outside the box, classification, and all of them have been covered nicely by Mr. Campana. What yeah, remains of me? Come on, Mr. Campana. It's a lot of time, but uh, you know, tried uh, as much as possible. But mm -hmm. uh, do let me know if uh, Abdullah and uh, you can uh, po you can put our uh, the our trust. Uh, you got that, uh, you know, hemodynamic unstability patients protocol. Absolutely. I will once, I will put it on Telegram group. Uh, and guys, if you missed to ask any question and you want yeah. to yeah. Uh, ask it, please put it in the Telegram group. I will pass it to Mr. Campana and give you the reply again. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, no concern at all. No problem at all. Very pleasure. Perfect. Thank you very much. Have a nice thank, evening, boys. Thank you very much, Mr. Campana. Yeah. Good May I you Thank you. May I remind everyone that you can request a CBD for this talk. Please in, get in contact with Firas and he will be very happy to provide that. In addition, please listen to this talk again on the YouTube uh, and it will be on YouTube hopefully within the coming couple of days. Again, I thank Mr. Campana deeply for no this worries, informative sir, sir. talk and uh, looking forward to seeing you again, Mr. Campana. No worries, sir. Thanks and uh, Abdullah, see you then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, guys, may I ask the mentors to stay on? Um,